Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part five of my series on the selected gross pathology of the respiratory system. Parts five and six are going to deal with bacterial diseases that affect the lungs. And I puzzled as to how I would separate this out, and finally just threw my hands up, said, okay, let's do companion lab animals first, and then in the sixth lecture we'll talk about uh, production animals, horses, and poultry. With that, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who, over the years, have provided me these fantastic images, which allow me to put these lectures together for you. The first slide is a slide from a cat. You can see that the thoracic cavity is totally full of a sanguinous exudate with large clumps of fibrin and likely pus. The lungs are also affected. They have detached from the uh, uh, the pleura, at least on this particular side. Whether you use the term pyothorax or thoracic empyema, both are very acceptable for something like this. These uh, pyothorax affects both dogs and cats. It's a tremendous wide range of presentations. Uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral. It cannot affect the lungs or it can affect the lungs. Uh, the animal can be have no, almost no clinical signs. Some cats are nomothermic. They have minimal clinical signs, and it's a surprise diagnosis at autopsy. There are a couple ways that animals get uh, this diffuse, severe infection of the thoracic cavity. With dogs, it's usually the result of a migrating plant on, which brings bacteria into the chest. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those bacteria later on in this lecture. In cats, there are two ways that it's spread. In feral cats, it's often spread by cat bites with inoculation of bacteria of the oral cavity into the chest cavity. But it's also seen in house cats as well by what's known as paraneumonic spread or the aspiration of bacteria that live in the oral cavity. Um, it, these infections are usually polymicrobial when you culture them they tend to have uh, uh, organisms in them that tolerate very little oxygen. Fusobacterium necrophorum, Truparella pyogenes, Pasteurella multocida, and some of the gram negatives are ones that are commonly isolated. So, one word answer for this, pyothorax. Here's a bacterial agent. Uh, in these lungs from a dog that we've talked about in previous lectures. And this is one that I don't want anyone to sleep on because we were taught in veterinary school that Bordetella bronchoseptica is an opportunistic bacteria that causes a dry hacking cough, known as kennel cough. But actually it's far worse than uh, we were led to believe. Uh, it is an opportunistic bacteria that gets into the lungs following a pre-existing uh, viral infection, at least in the dog, which could be something like adenovirus uh, or para-influenza or rarely distemper. Uh, but this uh, really nasty gram-negative has a wide range of, uh, uh, of toxins, dermonocrotic toxins. Toxins are very similar to what we see in the agents that cause shipping fever in cattle. And the histologic lesion actually ends up looking a lot like it with large areas of necrosis, infarction, and oat cell formation. There is vasculitis as well. Um, it's an interesting organism. Bordetella is one of those bacteria that want nothing more out of life than to be a cilium. Um, so generally they have uh, adhesions which allow them to attach to cilia. And if you get a good case of Bordetella and you run a gram stain and you find some areas where the airway epithelium is intact, you may actually be able to spot the Bordetella standing on end among the cilia, because the cilia won't stain with the gram stain, but the, the bacteria will. Um, so Bordetella is a bad actor in a wide variety of species. We tend to think only that it affects uh, um, dogs, but remember it's widespread in populations of pigs and rabbits. We've talked about its association with atrophic rhinitis. A lot of rabbits are carriers um, you can see it in normal animals. It's often seen combined with uh, uh, pasturella infections, 
which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. It doesn't cause a whole lot of problems for rabbits. They tend to be pretty well host adapted. Um, but it is this is an important source for other laboratory rodents such as guinea pigs. And here are the lungs of a guinea pig and you can see that the damage is considerable. We have a tremendous bronchopneumonia with hemorrhage and necrosis, large areas of infarction and necrosis in here. Guinea pigs do not tolerate Bordetella very well. So if you are going out at Easter time and you pass by the pet store where they have all of the bunnies and all the guinea pigs running around uh, for to become impulse buys at Easter time, make sure that you get one of the rabbits because all those guinea pigs are gonna be dead in about two to three weeks. Um, usually you have carrier animals in the facilities and periodic uh, flare-ups of this particular condition, especially in animals under stress. To show you a, a little more of the range of animals that uh, are affected with Bordetella bronchoseptica, these are the lungs of a rhesus monkey. Uh, and this particular monkey happened to be an animal model that was injected with a related agent uh, Bordetella peripertussis, which causes whooping cough in people. Um, but the lesion is very similar to what you see with Bordetella bronchoseptica. As a resident, I was involved in uh, uh, investigating an outbreak of Bordetella in our laboratory animal colony in a group of 12 macaques who had recently had surgery. And it turned out that uh, the technicians weren't being very good in terms of disinfecting. And so uh, the first animal that received uh, surgery uh, was carrying Bordetella bronchoseptica. And so because they were not cleaning the endotracheal tube very well, every additional animal after that got a nice dose of Bordetella bronchoseptica and they all uh, suffered severe lung damage and died within the, the next week. One other animal species, a nice picture by Dr. Matty Cupel, um, is pigs. We've talked about pigs being uh, uh, reservoir carriers for Bordetella bronchoseptica, and it's uh, one of the agents of non-progressive uh, atrophic rhinitis. Uh, in young pigs, two to three weeks of age, it can, because they don't have great immune systems yet, it can get down into the lungs and cause a necrotizing bronchopneumonia as well. So Bordetella, don't sleep on it. It is a pretty strong pathogen in a wide variety of species. Well, here's some really awful looking lungs. And this is a condition that uh, probably most of the literature has come up with in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, when I look at these lungs, I see a set of lungs that are not collapsing. They are exuding fluid and blood um, and they just, if you felt them, they would be very meaty because of the amount of fibrin in them. Uh, I want you, when you see something like this, just to quickly think, and we'll go back to the, uh, uh, the, the third lecture where we talked about canine influenza and the more severe cases of, of canine influenza can give you some really bad looking lungs. But when I see something that looks like this in a dog, especially one that was previously healthy three or four days prior, I want to think about extra intestinal uh, E. coli infections in animals that aspirate uh, or in animals that have some form of breakdown of the gastrointestinal mucosal barrier, whether it's a gastric ulcer or intestinal ulcers um, or something like that. Uh, they can uh, get certain serotypes of uh, E. coli, especially the O serotypes, into the bloodstream. And these are ones that possess some additional uh, toxins that uh, normally they wouldn't use in the intestine like cytotoxic necrotizing factor and homolysins and various adhesins which uh, help them to set up shop and cause extensive damage vasculitis and septal necrosis in the lung proper these lungs uh, are classic what used to be known as acute respiratory distress syndrome or diffuse alveolar damage. Um, there's a breakdown of the, the septum, there's an outpouring of hemorrhage, edema, and fibrin which polymerizes within the alveolus forming thick hyaline membranes along the surface of the uh, feet alveolar wall. 
And uh, so this is what gives you this type of picture, the hemorrhage and the tremendous amounts of fibrin. Um, there have been some really nice, this particular picture was from a 2019 case in conference, one of the Wednesday slide conference, wonderful write up. Um, another rule out uh, is a condition that has been documented over the last 10 or 15 years in shelter dogs and has caused some significant outbreaks, especially in the UK. Um, I recommend a paper by Pesavento and Priestnall in 2013 VetPath, which discusses um, outbreaks of Strep equi variant zoepidemicus in dogs, among a number of other uh, shelter diseases of note. Um, strep equi variant zoepidemicus doesn't think of something you would associate with uh, dog pneumonia, especially necrotizing dog pneumonia, um, because we've talked about it in association with horses, especially being a long-term contaminant of, of abscesses caused by a related species, strep equi subspecies equi, which is the cause of agent of equine strangles. We also mention it in another lecture series because it causes a suppurative uh, cervical lymphadenitis in, uh, in guinea pigs. Well, now you know, here's a third thing it will do, and it causes outbreaks of large numbers up into the hundreds of dogs in shelters. Other agents in cases of severe septicemia can get into the lung. This is a case of tularemia in a cat. Normally we uh, see pictures of multifocal areas of necrosis of the spleen, which are very characteristic of tularemia in cats. Uh, hot gram negatives like Francisella or some of the Salmonellas um, have a, or Yersinia have a very characteristic uh, pattern of attack uh, in the body of animals and people um, that ingest it. Uh, it really likes lymphoid tissue. So the classic triad of lesions, which are the first ones that you will see, are necrosis of the ileal uh, pyrus patches, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and the white pulp in the spleen. Now, if you're going after the wall of the gut, eventually you're going to get to the portal system, which liberates uh, bacterial colonies into the bloodstream. So you, they end up in the liver, they end up in the lungs. I don't haven't seen many cases like this because usually the animals die uh, more quickly than you get a really nice case of uh, embolic pneumonia. Embolic meaning it comes in from the bloodstream. So. So this would be the morphologic diagnosis, for those of y'all who are playing that game, is a multifocal coalescing suppurative embolic pneumonia. Okay, I said that I was going to, and we're gonna finish up uh, the uh, uh, lung diseases of the dog and the cat with a really good one. Um, this is the uh, thoracic cavity of a dog. We're looking at the pleural surface. And I've always said that if you open up a dog and it looks like someone has poured a jar or two of spaghetti sauce in its chest, you are probably dealing with one of the higher bacterial infections, usually in my experience, actinomyces. Um, actinomyces and acardia uh, cause a diffuse, chronic, proliferative, and suppurative uh, pyothorax. Um, in addition to that, you just have this, you see this sort of shagginess to the pleura. This is all of this shaggy stuff um, covering the inside of the chest. And you can also see this in the abdomen as well, because these are caused by those migrating plantons we talked about. They have these little barbules, they penetrate the side and they just go moving along through the chest because the barbs point outwards and backwards so they can't back out so they just move forward and forward until they hit a hard object like a rib and they stop or like uh, the uh, ventral aspect of one of the vertebra and they stop but what they've done is they've dragged a bunch of bacteria and the uh, uh, microaerophilic higher bacteria uh, actinomyces and nocardia are classic for causing this now the shagginess that i think i, I wandered away from is tremendous mesothelial hyperplasia. On top of all the exudates, on top of all the suppuration, you get this 
crazy proliferation of the mesothelium to the extent that uh, whenever, uh, and I've seen it so many times over the years, we see a, a fair number of these dogs come through and the resident always jumps to mesothelioma because they can't imagine anything else causing a tremendous mesothelial hyperplasia like you see in this particular condition. Um, but the giveaways, and there are a couple of giveaways, the giveaways um, grossly are the presence of these ye little yellow flakes which are known as sulfur granules. And sulfur granules are really, they, they look cool grossly, but they're very boring histologically. All they are is a mat of filamentous organisms, usually round, with some neutrophils on the outside. And that's what a sulfur granule is. And when you see sulfur granules, you're probably dealing with actinomyces, uh, not nocardia. Nocardia doesn't make sulfur granules. So this is how I remember that. No cardia, no sulfur granules. Uh, sometimes you don't get either and you get something like bacteroides on this, uh, out of this. But uh, so, and as I said before, you can also see it in the abdomen. You can see the mesothelial proliferation and the suppuration in the abdomen as well. But remember, spaghetti sauce, no cardia, no sulfur granules. Okay, so let's move into some of the laboratory animal species. And here's a bunny rabbit with a sort of snotty nose, a little discharge from the eyes because the lacrimal glands are, are blocked. And he's got his head cocked to one side. And these are classic lesions for a syndrome which we've all called snuffles over the years. Uh, it is caused by Pasteurella multocida. It's a very common disease in rabbits. And uh, you can have uh, carriers which range up to 70% in some colonies. So uh, you always consider that uh, uh, rabbits have pasteurellosis. You'll find it is one of the most common diseases of rabbits. It causes a wide range of symptoms, primarily respiratory. You can also have uh, reproductive syndromes as well. Uh, like Bordetella, direct contact is the most important method of spread. Before I go too far into Pasteurella, um, Pasteurella is another one of those agents that you never ever want to sleep on. It's as bad as Bordetella and certain species worse and we're going to look at a lot of different syndromes in the lung that are associated with Pasteurella. It's never good to have Pasteurella in your lung. Um, and there are a number of species that you have to think about and a lot of the agents which young pathologists have grown up with actually when I started out we're, we're in the genus Pasteurella, so there's a lot of bad actors that have been called Pasteurella now called, some, called something else, like Mannheimia hemolytica. I learned is Pasteurella hemolytica. Pasteurella multocida has, has maintained the same. Uh, Biebersteinia uh, used to be Pasteurella. So when we think about the Pasteurellas, we're thinking about really potent agents. So back to Pasteurella multocida and the rabbit or snuffles uh, because the animals have a, a uh, sort of catarrhal or mucoid uh, rhinitis. Pasteurella, because we have such a high incidence of carriers, is something that's often associated with environmental changes, poor sanitation, crowded conditions, uh, the onset of cold weather. These are all uh, poorly uh, clean cages, so high ammonia. These are all things that will uh, precipitate a good case of snuffles. And snuffles is a whole lot more than uh, uh, a snotty nose. Um, it's a severe uh, pulmonic disease or pleural pneumonia. Here's a case of uh, uh, severe pleuritis due to the rupture of an abscess. In, uh, in an animal's body. Remember, it's another good one if you're not practicing really good uh, disinfection can be passed from animal to animal during the course of a day in surgery. Um, whereas you see can see abscesses in any part of the animal, uh, they're extremely common in the respiratory tract, but you can see them in the lymph nodes throughout the animals. You can also see them in the skin. Another common spot is the lymph nodes underneath here or the bones of the face. And it, the 
pus that's associated with uh, uh, with pastorella is often a very tenacious, sticky pus, not terribly liquid. But the manifestations of respiratory disease due to snuffles in rabbits are many and varied. So whenever you see a pneumonia in a rabbit, it's probably going to be at the top of your list. Uh, so we have a nice pleural pneumonia here. Uh, here's another case where you have fibrin plaques and there are areas of hemorrhage and necrosis throughout the lung fields. Here's one where the lung was just a big bag of pus, all due to Pastorella multocida. We're going to look at Pastorella multocida uh, in the next lecture when we get into the shipping fever complex. Um, and that is one of the six different agents we're going to talk about in terms of shipping fever in cattle. I grew up with three, but as I've progressed along in my career, I've added three more, which I think need to be. So now shipping fever is up to six different agents. Um, grossly, they all sort of look alike, but there are some characteristics we're going to identify that might help you sort them out. Um, the other thing that you have to consider in rabbits that is going to mimic uh, pastorella in a lot of things, especially abscess formation in the lungs, abscess formation in the skin, uh, is going to be staph aureus. And that's why culture or cytology uh, at the minimum uh, is extremely important. And, and uh, staph aureus is often a disease of very young animals. You can see st staph septicemia. Um, with little foci of necrosis in the viscera and in the skin as well. So, pastoral is always at the top of your list, but you got to include staff and you got to do the work to sort those two out. Well, here's an African green monkey that has seen better days, um, has sort of a hemorrhagic exudate uh, from its nose. And we're going to talk for just a minute of what I consider the shipping fever of non-human primates. Here is a set of lungs with a severe necrotizing uh, low bar pneumonia. And these are usually animals that have been shipped. And then over the course of the coming weeks, you see a low morbidity with a high mortality. Um, some of the animals will also manifest uh, with upper respiratory or middle ear infections. And it, it seems to be more common in young animals. Um, there are also certain species that you can have spontaneous outbreaks and uh, aotis or owl monkeys and chimpanzee colonies have had outbreaks of Klebsiella pneumoniae. Okay, Klebsiella pneumoniae, I don't think it's a difficult histologic diagnosis because it causes uh, the formation of large areas of inflammation. Uh, it's, it's tough to, large bacterial colonies, there often is not a tremendous amount of inflammation associated with them because Klebsiella pneumoniae is one of those agents which uh, produces a capsule polysaccharide capsule, which sort of keeps everything at arm's length and it makes it very difficult. But when the, uh, when the immune response is able to attack the bacteria, um, it has a very potent uh, endotoxin and a number of other toxins which cause severe damage in the lungs. The, the quote-unquote abscesses, and I don't really like that term, but the abscesses you can see are very common in the lung. Uh, but you can see anywhere. You can see them in the meninges. You can see them in the liver or the spleen. Um, and so not a difficult diagnosis to me when you get in there. And once again, another case of uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, Klebsiella pneumoniae pneumonia in, uh, in a non-human primate. And you can just see how much damage there's done with a lot of fibrin on the surface areas of uh, hemorrhage and underlying necrosis. You can even see rib imprints in, in these grossly swollen lungs. Now there has been a new wrinkle in Klebsiella pneumoniae in uh, 
non human primates and people within the last ten or fifteen years i'm going to put this picture up and this is a a plate of club a particular strain of club zeal pneumonia the hyper muco vis viscous strain um, essentially this refers to the capsule there are some capsule or antigens that you can identify through pcr but a one of the early and quickest tests was known as the string test where you simply put uh, uh, your little applicator down on one of the colonies and you pull upwards and if this string is longer than a half a millimeter if it stretches out like this it's some evidence that you're dealing with hypermucoviscous strains a very uh, viscous type of capsule in these agents now the disease caused by hypermucoviscous strains is a little different um, there in people and in uh, non-human primates there is a uh, it tends to form abscesses in the abdominal cavity very tenacious abscesses in, in the abdominal cavity not the septicemia that we associate with the normal strains it's been identified in people it's been identified in non-human primates there was an outbreak in african greens which have been recently imported uh from uh, uh saint kitts in a military facility about 10 years ago and this picture is from that it was a submission on the wednesday slide conference so you can go back and look at that it has recently been identified in pinnipeds of all things off the coast of california so uh, hypermucoviscous Klebsiella pneumoniae, if you are taking a certification exam, that's something you probably should be a little familiar with. If we look at, at pneumonic diseases of non-human primates, one of the classic diseases, we don't see it as much as we used to, um, is uh, a, a condition caused by strep pneumoniae. Okay. If you think about strep, and I can't say this enough, and you, uh, whenever you see tremendous outpouring of fiber, and I want you to think about strep for just a minute, and so many different species of animals have their own particular type of strep, like strep suis and pigs, strep pneumonia, which affects non-human primates, which can affect uh, laboratory rodents and people, uh, possums with strep viridans, cattle with strep bovis. But one of the things that um, they all do is they have syndromes where they cause a tremendous polycerositis. Uh, and this, what we're looking at are just large aggregates of uh, fibrin in the potential spaces of the body, the pleura, the peritoneum, the meninges, the joints, all of these are uh, potential spaces. And in cases of uh, strep septicemias may fill with fibrin. This is a condition we don't see so much in, in non-human primates because the, the uh, complicating factor in all these infections are people. We all carry strep pneumonia in our respiratory systems and if you culture you can get it out of about 60% in the winter time. Most of the outbreaks of this uh, occur in the winter time. It's also a very common cause of pneumonia in people as well but we don't see that we used to have 95 percent positivity back in the 70s um and then when cold weather would hit or some viral infection then you would get these cases but so whenever you see something that looks like this think about strep this is a, a pet uh non-human primate great picture by bonnie uh Brunsecki, and you can see that the tremendous amount of fibrin this is a case so combined infection with strep pneumonia and e coli but just think either of those agents can cause a fibrinous uh, polycerositis and we'll look at uh, systemic colobacillosis when we get to the next lecture and how it looks very similar to this but a lot of fibrin in a non-human primate i want you to think about strep and just to uh, to lump them all together this is a fantastic picture from a guinea pig. This was taken probably back in the 60s when strep was a real problem. It's a historic disease in laboratory colonies. But what you are looking at, if you're having trouble getting uh, uh, getting your bearings on this, is this is a cross section through the two lungs and the heart. Okay, so here's a cross section to the heart with the right ventricle here. Here is one lung which looks pretty good. Here is the other lung 
which looks like there's a tremendous amount of consolidation going on here. And this is a really thick plaque of polymerized fibrin, which encase the organs in the abdominal cavity. So uh, like most guinea pig lesions uh, or diseases, you see them in the weanlings, you see them in the young, you see them in the pregnant sows. Um, and of course, this is one that you'd had recent environmental changes. And you can imagine that this uh, has a fairly high mortality rate and then the ones that survive will become carriers from, uh, and then you always have it in your facility. Here is a, uh, a, an agent that I did not know that much of, and this is a, a case from the Wednesday Slide Conference from a number of years ago. And this is a cinemologous macaque, and one of the two most common causes of uh, pneumonia in the winter is that we've looked at one, that's strep pneumoniae, and then the other one is uh, a gram-positive pleomorphic bacillus, which is known as Carinobacterium ulcerans. Another case from the Wednesday Slide Commerce within the last 10 years. So you may want to go back and uh, look at that. Remember, Carinobacterium has a number of toxins. It was a classic agent causing diphtheria in people. So it has a, uh, has a necrotoxin, which causes vasculitis. And, and once again, a tremendous outpouring of fiber and a cross section of this particular pneumonic lung shows tremendous uh, consolidation. So, uh, a Carinobacterium ulcerans in uh, non-human primates. If you're not familiar with it, go back and take a look. Wednesday slide conference. Okay, if you're working with non-human primates and you want your day to be ruined in a hurry, well, you open one up and you get something that looks like this, especially rhesus monkeys. And what we're looking at is a lung that has numerous granulomas within it. One of the reasons that we always wear our personal protective gear um, when we are dealing with non-human primates, especially respirators, because they are so susceptible to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, as I've said before, many of the diseases of non-human primates are diseases of captivity. They, they are exposed to diseases when um, they are shipped or they are mixed or they come in contact, as we see with mycobacterium tuberculosis, with people who catch them or handle them um, uh, who are infected with tuberculosis. And because they are so susceptible, um, they will come down with it fairly readily. They will have, as opposed to mycobacterium bovis in cattle, they will have pretty readily identifiable signs and pathology um, associated with it. Uh, we don't see a lot of cases of mycobacterium tuberculosis probably arising uh, in this country because everyone that works with uh, laboratory primates is tested but uh, when they are captured, um, when they are transported, they have the possibility to come in contact um, with people with mycobacterium. I would imagine that, uh, you know, we like to go to these tourist places that have free-ranging macaques, um, and I would imagine a number of them are infected with uh, tuberculosis. Another reason to take uh, any interaction with primates very seriously. Uh, apes are also very susceptible to tuberculosis, and New World monkeys, not so much. The granulomas that they cause, they see, you can see them in multiple organs um, because they often will rupture and liberate their uh, contents of the bacilli into the bloodstream. So you can see them in the brain, you can see them in the liver, but the lung is by far the most common because that is the general route of uh, introduction by inhalation. Um, the vast majority of these are, are very characteristic granulomas. Histologically, they um, have a large center of uh, just cellular debris with a thin cast of mineral. They're very characteristic looking. The other thing that makes them characteristic are the presence of uh, certain types of giant uh, syncytial macrophages, including Langhans type, in which the nuclei are arranged in a C. Whenever I see 
those Langhans type cells, first thing I'm thinking about is always going to be mycobacterium, especially in a primate. Now, not all of these are, you know, these sort of mineralized granulomas. That thin sheet of, of mineral on top, uh, it takes a couple of times that you, then you can pick it up. It's where it got the name calcareous because it means cheese-like. And someone looked at that and says it looks like cheese. Doesn't look like any cheese I've ever seen, but uh, that's where it got that name. Maybe it was more along the gross aspects or this slightly gritty yellowish appearance. And a lot of these, uh, um, a lot of mycobacterial infections have sort of a yellow tinge to them. Now. They're not all granulomas. If you get them that are, are close to the pleural surface or close to an airway, they can um, become somewhat liquidy. And you'll look at that and you'll say, well, that's probably just an abscess where you're actually looking at a tubercle. So yeah, close to the airway, they will become, the pus will become a little more liquid. When we look at rhodococcus sequoia, you have sort of the same thing going on there and it is also a higher bacterium closely related to mycobacteria so don't sleep on the uh don't sleep on abscesses in the chest now over time these uh, tubercles will mineralize they can get they can increase in size and mineralize to the point where the animals will actually asphyxiate if they're present in the hyalur lymph nodes and that's what's going on here you can see that in uh, some other diseases in animals like Carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis. Those uh, hyalur lymph nodes are really badly positioned, great to uh, trap uh, bacteria and have granulomous inflammation, but they can, uh, they can pinch if they get too big and hard, they can pinch off those airways and the animals can actually asphyxiate. As we leave a non-human primates, let's spend a little time with the laboratory rodents. And what we're looking at here is just one large abscess. Uh, when we get into the, the, to the mice, with the exception of, of uh, mycoplasma, I think a lot of the other agents, it's basically a, a differential diagnosis, a laundry list of agents. One of the ones and the cause of agent in this particular uh, case is an opportunistic agent called Pasteurella, another Pasteurella, Pasteurella pneumotropica. Okay, but it, you could have a number of other ones. I would think about Carinobacterium, Coochari, Staph, uh, Streptobacillus, Maniliformis. Um, very difficult. It's not very characteristic when you just have a big abscess in the lung. So you know, these are ones that culture and PCR are going to give you the diagnosis. Okay, one of the classic diseases that cause pneumonia in mice and rats um, is mycoplasma pulmonis. And we're going to talk about mycoplasma uh, again when we get to cattle and shipping fever, but mycoplasma. Uh, is a bacterium that lacks a cell wall. They are about the most stripped down bacilli uh, that we have ever identified. They have jettisoned a lot of their normal uh, internal organelles uh, to live a truly parasitic uh, lifestyle. One of the few things that they have not jettisoned are adhesins, which allow them to meld with cilia. So they are also another one of those bacteria want nothing more to do with cilia. And that's important because when we talk about Bordetella, we talk about mycoplasma, we talk about one more, uh, what used to be known as cilia associated respiratory bacillus. Um, now I believe it's Rodentobacter. But you can always find these particular agents along the airway or any other place where you have cilia. And it's very characteristic. You find them in the middle ear, which has cilia. You find them in the reproductive tract. So they cause reproductive infections. And above all, they cause pneumonia, which is centered on the bronchi and the bronchioles expands out from there. And what happens is you get a mycoplasma infection. And for something that has a, a very little, they, they are totally parasitic. They cannot make their, any of their own energy. So they're dependent upon the cell that they parasitize for energy. Um, but they do have a number of toxins and they have a super antigen. What those do is 
once they set up shop along the cilia of uh, uh, of the airways, they cause necrosis and recruit a lot of neutrophils. The neutrophils um, enter these bronchi. They break down the elastin and they devolve into pus and necrotic debris. So all of these areas which look like abscesses are actually dilated ectotic airways. They're big bags of pus which used to be airways and the animal's never going to get rid of it. It can't mobilize it. There's no cilia. There's no mucociliary escalator. Um, and those bronchi themselves are way too big. So the big bags of pus that the animal's going to carry around in its lungs for the rest of its life. The other thing that you will see with mycoplasma infections, and they're common in almost every species, from cattle to dogs to cats to ferrets, uh, is it has a superantigen which causes tremendous lymphoid proliferation. So surrounding the airways, oftentimes, are going to be huge numbers of lymphocytes and plasma cells. So whenever I see pneumonia in uh, any species where there's a tremendous lymphoid hyperplasia, not just bald hyperplasia, but just an aggregation of lymphocytes and lesser numbers of plasma cells around those airways, I'm going to think, okay, can I be dealing with mycoplasma here? So going back to mycoplasma pulmonis, it's been known forever. You don't see it in laboratories anymore, but if you go out to the pet stores and get a couple of mice or rats, you'll probably run into it. It used to be called uh, murine respiratory mycoplasmosis. It's been called uh, uh, chronic pneumonia of rats. Uh, it's had a lot of different names, but the agent is mycoplasma pulmonis. I think that the morphologic diagnosis is very important in the appearance because it generally affects the craniovental. It is a bronchopneumonia. The morphologic diagnosis for this is a multifocal coalescing suppurative bronchopneumonia with bronchiectasis. When we used to put a lot of value on morphologic diagnosis, this is one that you always had to have that with and for full points, with bronchiectasis, because that's what you see with this. And when we get to mycoplasma bovis in cattle, a important disease in cattle in North America, we're going to see the exact same lesion with bronchiectasis. You want to see bronchiectasis? Here's a fixed specimen. This is bronchiectasis. These were all airways. Now they're just big bags of pus. You never mobilize this. You die with this particular lesion. And another case of suppurative bronchopneumonia with bronchiectasis. Okay, I think we've beaten that one to death. I wish I had a better picture of uh, Philobacterium rodentium. That's the name. Uh, it used to be Carbacillus. I like that one. Um, car was short for cilia associated respiratory bacillus. That's before they actually stuck a name on it. And it was, it is a rule out in rodents and rabbits for a mycoplasma because if you look, and this is one that's very easy, when you put a, a, a special stain on mycoplasma, you get nothing. It's got no cell wall. Okay, you don't see it. You have to go to EM and look. It's down the base of cilia, and it's sort of weird. I remember the first couple of weeks of my residency. I was uh, looking for mycoplasma in the lungs of turtles, tortoises, Latin tortoises, actually, and uh, desert tortoises. And then now it's a well-known, uh, a well-known disease, mycoplasmosis of these desert tortoises. And I was looking for bacteria, and I probably spent two weeks looking for bacteria in the lungs or anything in the lungs of these turtles. And all the time I was looking at the mycoplasma, but because I was a young resident, I didn't know really what I was looking at. I thought I was looking at little mucus droplets because there wasn't any cell wall, which is how you would identify a bacterium. It's also why uh, when you get a case of, of walking pneumonia, which is just mycoplasma, uh, you have to be put on a, a special uh, type of, of antibiotic, Zithromax or z -Pax, because most antibiotics work against the cell wall of bacteria. And mycoplasmas don't have one. That's another part of their anatomy they have stripped down. Um, the genome of certain types of mycoplasma are, is the smallest of any living organism uh, outside of viruses. Um, so, but to get back to uh, Carbacillus or Philobacterium rodentium, not a great picture. 
um, and I apologize for that, but that's all I got. And you can see we have the same effect with the uh, bronchioles being extremely p prominent due to the fact that they are laden with bacteria, they are full of inflammatory cells, and this would be your, a di your only significant differential diagnosis for uh, mycoplasma pulmonis in rodents. Oh, and I have another one for you. Uh, another differential. I don't think it's a differential, um, but a lot of people do, especially if you're, you're new in your program, so let me clear this one up. Okay, this is a condition that if you just looked at, glanced at, you say, oh, we got mycoplasma, but you don't because there's a couple of things that I want you to see here. Number one, these are abscesses. They're multiple sized. If you look at uh, our mycoplasma, there, there's there's not this great range of size of the the bronchioles. The distribution is different. Okay, it's not anteroventral here. Here's the heart here. It's not anteroventral. It is scattered throughout all of the lung lobes. Some are very big, some are very small, and they are surrounded by a area of hemorrhage. Okay, these are true abscesses, and this is caused by a agent known as Carinobacterium cuchari, which every self-respecting mouse or rat has, and you don't generally ever see it unless they are severely stressed or immunosuppressed, and then they will develop abscesses throughout the body, not just in the lungs, also in the kidneys, spleen, liver. Um, you can, you will get this if you knock out a rodent's immune system. Um, the condition, a bad name, used to be called pseudotuberculosis, but Carinobacterium cuchari. Some people say it's a differential from mycoplasma. I don't think so. To me, they look very different, but now you know why they look different, and hopefully you won't make that mistake. What are you thinking about? You're right. You're thinking about strep for just a minute because look at all of the fibrin here. And you're right. This is Streptococcus pneumoniae. This is a rat, so it's not just guinea pigs and primates. It's anything in the laboratory animal colony where you have people walking around not practicing good sanitation and disease prevention. Don't see this much anymore, but you used to. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Okay, so we are winding down here. Just have a couple of other things I just want to throw in here. And we'll call it a day on the companion animal and a laboratory animal. And this is a picture from a, uh, about a six-year-old article by Dr. Matty Kupel up in Michigan State. And this was uh, uh, the lesion in a ferret which had a lot of breathing problems. And you can see that the uh, airways are full of a sort of mucus or catarrhal exudate. Uh, this was a new one on me when because I don't remember ever seeing it when it was published. In this particular uh, group of ferrets, there were three ferrets that had difficulty uh, breathing, dyspnea or labored breathing. They had a particular wheezing sound, and when they were sacrificed, um, they identified mycoplasma. So from our discussion of mycoplasma, you can probably intimate that um, they had a significant inflammatory response, which was focused on the uh, on the airways. Um, this paper was published uh, eight years ago, and I cannot find a new name. It was a putative mycoplasma species. I don't know if it's ever been named, um, and I haven't heard a lot more about it since then. So I don't know. Maybe it's going to be mycoplasma mustelae or something like that. And then finally, not really a companion animal, but it's a pet. It's not really companionable, but we're looking at uh, the lung of a snake. Um, and there are granulomas throughout this. One of the things that you'll see in reptiles uh, under captive conditions, you can also see it in fish, it's extremely common, is mycobacteriosis, generally infection with mycobacterium avium uh, as a large grouping. And nowadays we have the ability to go in and, and speciate these. And there's all sorts of species now. I'm not sure whether this was Kansasii or Fortuitum or Coloniae or something like that. I remember I was lucky when I started. They, we just called them all Mycobacterium avium. This was before PCR and all of that. And it was a much easier 
uh, way to keep track of all this. So I would call Mycobacterium avium. And uh, I'll give you a little hint. If you are submitting something like this, we get a lot of Mycobacterium avium for the Wednesday Slide Conference every year. Various species, whether it's mammals, whether it's birds, whether it's fish or whatever. If you want that one to be used, you need to speciate it these days. Uh, submission for the Wednesday Slide Conference, if it's an infectious agent, you should have a definitive culture, a definitive PCR, something that's be, that will give get us a little beyond, ah, it's Mycobacterium avium. Okay, we do get a lot of them, we can't use them all. And so that's one of the classic things that I look at when I'm evaluating Wednesday Slide Conference cases, whether to put them in the rotation. Uh, on infectious diseases, did people go the extra mile. You're only submitting a couple of Wednesday slide conferences a year, probably only one infectious disease, and you really need to have a definitive diagnosis saying, oh, it's mycobacterium, it's a common thing. That's not going to get that case used in the Wednesday slide conference. But whenever I see something like this in a poikilotherm, a fish, reptile, amphibian, my go-to uh, is going to be mycobacterium because it's just really, really common. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this particular lecture. In our next lecture on bacterial lung diseases, we're going to get into shipping fever. We're going to get into the diseases of the horse lung. And there's a lot of fun stuff in there. And we'll finish with some poultry diseases of the lung. I guarantee you we're going to see Pasteurella again and again and again. And it might not be called Pasteurella, but it was when I started years ago. So, something to look forward to uh, with that. Uh, I want everybody to be safe, stay out of spray, wear the mask, okay? Let's all take care of each other, and I will see you tomorrow with another lecture.